Okay, by way of introduction, my name is Pastor Charles Burnett Morrow, B-U-R-N-E-T-T -T hyphen Morrow, M-O-R-R-O-W. Uh, my partner Tommy and I have been together since December of 2001. That's when we first met, and we've pretty much been together, you know, like glue since then, for the most part. And uh, we made it legal uh, back in 2015 when that option became available to us as we were living in Texas at the time. And um, so we've been together just shy of 22 years. We've <clears throat> legally been together. Next month will be eight years. So... Um, uh, that is why my last name is hyphenated. When we made it legal, we decided instead of, you know, trying to figure out what to do with the names, I said, well, <clears throat> why don't we just combine our names and that way we'll both have the same exact last name, you know, and, uh, and that ought to make it a lot easier if you ever have to go into a hospital, you know, or anything like that. So we decided to hyphenate the names. And ever being the gentleman, I thought Tommy's last name should go first. So uh, Burnett hyphen Morrow, my last name is Morrow, M-O-R-R-O-W. Uh, I was born and raised in Southern New England, Connecticut to be exact. And uh, I actually was raised in a small uh, Pentecostal church in Southern New England. We were part of the Assemblies of God organization. Uh, the church I grew up in, I loved. And to be honest with you, unlike a lot of people, and the South is a lot different than the North. You kind of have to remember that if you would. Um, the, the South has always been a little bit more, uh, you know, <laughs> I won't say dogmatic, you know, or, or you know, nasty, <laughs> preaching hard. And, you know, um, the North was always <clears throat> much more diverse. The church I grew up in was a very diverse church. We had black Sunday school teachers and, and uh, workers in the church who were black and Hispanic and Asian, and, you know. And I never thought anything of it. It... it you know, it's just the way I grew up. And um, I loved the people that I grew up with. I loved my pastors. I loved my church experience. A lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, I grew up in a really negative home environment. And uh, my mom was a believer, uh, but she had an extremely difficult time trying to walk in any form of victory because my father who is a raging narcissist uh, I mean a very very bad narcissist um, was constantly tearing her down tearing his children down and um, just very verbally abusive like you can't believe and uh, embarrassed the fire out of his wife and kids in front of our family members. I mean, my father thought nothing of talking his wife down to her family. So he'd be at my grandparents' house, my mother's parents' house, and telling them what a worthless pile of garbage she was, how she didn't know how to keep house, or how she this, how she that, you know. And he did the same thing with the wee kids. He would do it with members of his family, he'd do it with members of our family. He would do it with people in public that we didn't know, but he did. People in public that he didn't know and nobody knew. Um, I mean, literally, this is the kind of environment that I grew up in. So the church was always a very positive haven for me. When I went to church, there were people there that were loving and that were supportive of me, that encouraged me. I heard things from church folks um, 
that I never heard at home by way of encouragement and, you know, things like that. And so my experience growing up in the Pentecostal church in southern New England was actually very positive. Now, I knew I was dealing with an issue uh, concerning, I, I don't want to say my sexuality, um, because at a very early age it didn't have anything to do with sex. And I think most of us uh, who are of the LGBT persuasion, um, when you're dealing with an alternate uh, sexual identification, sexual orientation, um, if you are if you're aware of there being something different in you and about you when you're young, um, you know it doesn't have anything to do with sex because at that point I don't know what sex is. And not only do I not know what it is, I don't care what it is. I wasn't thinking about sex, but like I was telling my uh, a doctor, I had a doctor's appointment last week, and I was telling the lady doctor that I was uh, seeing, um, you know, I told her, I said, all I knew is when I was in third grade, man, uh, there were certain fellas in school that when they came around, boy, my heart just started pounding, and I'd get all flustered just like a little girl with a crush, you know. And I didn't know nothing. There wasn't a sexual thought within a million miles of me. So it had nothing to do with sex. But somehow my attractions and my um, affections were drawn toward... Um, members of the same gender. So I had this issue to contend with. For, I mean, honestly, going back about as far as I can remember, I, um, I grew up, I wouldn't say the church I was in was like really massively homophobic or nasty because they weren't really. Um, you always had, you know, that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah baloney, you know. In other words, Sodom and Gomorrah were always presented as having been destroyed for homosexuality, you know. But see, I didn't identify with Sodom and Gomorrah as a child because from what did I know about, you know, again, I didn't understand all that sexuality business, you know. And uh, so, but as I grew up and as I got older, obviously, there were occasional instances where um, homosexuality was preached against and there were occasions when it was preached against rather hard. Generally, to be honest with you, not by my pastors. Usually it would be uh, like some visiting uh, minister that came through, maybe an evangelist or something, you know. Um, but my pastors really didn't harp on it and, you know, didn't ride that horse to death like so many preachers do. I received the Holy Ghost at a very early age. I was literally about five or so, and an evangelist came through our church, conducted a revival, I think for about a week or so, and during the course of his meetings, I received the Holy Ghost. I really didn't understand how to operate in the Spirit, and you know, uh, the purpose and the, the uh, um, walking in the Spirit, you know, at that age. However, by the time I was about 12, I kind of figured it out and asked the Lord to uh, stir up the gift that was within me, and then uh, He did so, and I was able then, of course, to begin to learn about trying to walk in the Spirit and, you know, that sort of thing. I was sitting in the pew of the little Assembly of God Church I grew up in in southern New England. Um, we had a little tiny wood frame church building that probably held, you know, maybe 100 to 120, 130 people. It was not a big building. We had these little very simple stained glass windows. Um, it didn't have pictures in it, you know, it was just the little squares different stained glass squares, you know, made up our windows. And we had these old wood pews, and uh, they they were old, I'll tell you what. Um, they had a cushion that lay across the seat 
up the pew, but they were not padded pews. They were just wood pews, and they literally just had a cushion that sat across the bottom of the pew. And uh, uh, we had a prayer room, and we had the pastor's office on either side of the platform. We had to have our baptistry under the platform. So whenever they'd be baptizing anybody, they used to literally have to, the platform was on a hinge, and they would lift it up and reveal the baptistry underneath, and that's how they baptized folks. Downstairs, we probably had maybe, I think we might have had three or four Sunday school rooms, and then we had a little fellowship hall in a kitchen. But it was a very, very, you know, um, kind of a country church in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, the community I grew up in was not real huge. Um, Huntsville was a massive major city compared to the town that I grew up in. The town I grew up in was like a Norman Rockwell painting. It literally had about 3,000 some odd people in it. Um, it had been established way back in the colonial days. Connecticut and the Northeast has a lot of communities that have been around for hundreds of years since the founding of our nation and since the pilgrims came, you know. Uh, so there was um, I a little bit of issue with when I take my cancer medication, sometimes my stomach kind of gives me grief. So I'm having a little bit of that, huh? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so excuse me for that. So anyway, um, I'm going to try not to get too bogged down in details so that I can give you an overview and not take all night doing it. Okay, so the Lord called me to preach when I was eight years old, uh, sitting in the pew of that little church in southern New England, and uh, he confirmed that call through Dr. C.M. Ward, a uh, very famous Assembly of God preacher who used to be the national uh, radio uh, evangelist for the Assemblies of God radio program Harvest Time. And then he later confirmed it yet again through prophecy, um, a minister that had grown up in the same church I did, but he had not seen me since I was literally an infant, uh, less than one year old. He had not seen me in 16 years, and uh, he happened to come preach for the church I grew up in, and I happened to be uh, in Connecticut at that time, and I went to see him because he was a friend of our family. My mother grew up with him, and all my aunts and uncles grew up with him, and my grandparents knew his parents and so on and so forth. So I really wanted to hear him preach, you know. And in the middle of his message, he literally just stopped dead in the middle of his message and turned on his heels and laid his hands on my head and began to prophesy. And he confirmed a number of things word for word that the Lord had shown me or spoken to me over the years that I had shared with my family about my calling and my ministry and what kind of ministry the Lord said I would have, and interestingly enough, this man, literally every single point, he hit it right on the head in prophecy. Uh, so my whole life, growing up as a kid in school, um, Tommy's making me something for my stomach, so in a minute I'm going to have to take a little drink uh, to calm this down a little bit. Um, my whole life, from the time that I was in grammar school, I literally was aiming toward becoming a preacher of the gospel and a pastor. Uh, that is all I knew. And when a Sunday school teacher asked our class one day, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Um, she got around to me and she said, Chuck, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I don't want to be anything. I said, I have to preach. 
And uh, I was literally eight, nine years old when this happened. And Sister Star was her name. And she said that she felt like somebody poured a great big container of hot oil over the top of her head. She said, the Spirit of the Lord just came over me. She said, and I knew when you said that, that God had called you. She, I could feel it just in the words that you spoke. I could feel that God had indeed called you. Excuse me, one quick second. Sorry about that. These days, Elka Seltzer and I kind of have a love affair going on. It really settles my stomach when uh, my medication, for whatever reason, upset. I don't know why, it's just certain days, certain times, it'll upset my stomach something awful. Anyway, so uh, Sister Star told my mom, she said, when you get home, ask your son what he wants to be when he grows up. So my mother got me home, she asked me, and my mother said when I answered her, she said the same identical sensation that had come over Sister Star. Now Sister Star did not tell my mother what she had experienced, but my mother told me later what she experienced, and what she had experienced and what Sister Star experienced were literally identical, and my mother said it just felt like somebody took like a great big container of warm oil and just poured it over me. She said it just went down over my whole body. And she said, I knew right then and there that uh, the Lord must surely have genuinely called you. So growing up as a kid, I was always headed uh, for ministry. That was the only, um, the only thing I ever wanted to do. Is that your laptop? How is it? It's the only uh, thing I ever wanted to do. It's the only thing I ever knew to do. Um, it, it was a divine mandate. You know, it was more than simply uh, my choosing a profession. Because to be honest with you, prior to the Lord calling me, I had actually played with a number of things. I wanted to be a fireman. I wanted to be a doctor at one point. I, I used to love, um, I've been cooking since I was a kid too, and I always dreamed of one day have my own bakery. That was a little dream I had for a while. I thought I'd love to have my own bakery and decorate cakes. See, a little, a little clue there. <laughs> Maybe I was different, you know. But I used to love to watch, you know, beautiful cakes, wedding cakes and stuff. And I was, oh, I'd like to do that. That would be neat, you know. So anyway, um, at the age of 12, I actually um, started a clown ministry. And I created a character. His name was Jiggle. It was an acronym. I, I love to use acronyms. Uh, J I G capital J small I capital G dash capital G small I small L. So the name itself, you know, was kind of cutesy. And he was called Jiggle. And uh, Jiggle the Clown, the name stood for Jesus is God. And then there was the dash, and God is love. There were so many uh, hints in that ministry toward who I would eventually become and what I would eventually come to believe and uh, the type of ministry I'd one day have. Uh, but one of the things that was interesting is I had gone to a costume shop and was looking for a wig for some sort of clown hair to use for Jiggle, you know. And this is long before you could go to all these shops and buy the rainbow wigs that you buy now um, for pride parades and stuff, you know. But I bought a rainbow wig. I actually had Jiggle had rainbow hair, interestingly enough. And again, I had no clue of any um, 
meaning in the rainbow, you know, outside of Noah's Ark story. That was the only uh, rainbow that I was familiar with. Um, so I wound up with my clown ministry. I was too young to drive, but I was always very grown and very precocious and always acted much older than my age. And there were people in my church, including an uncle of mine, who volunteered and said, if you ever need to get to an appointment, if you ever need to get to um, a place that you've booked for your ministry, said, we will take you. So I always had a way to get to whatever church I might be ministering in. And my ministry, uh, it did become known at some level. In southern New England, I was able to do children's crusades, um, vacation Bible schools. Some churches would do what they call a children's crusade day. So it was a one-day event, and they would have a crusade specifically for children. Um, Jiggle was, in many ways, a very serious ministry. I did use puppets and things like that. I had puppets that were my sidekicks, and we had little skits worked out and what have you. And again, I had volunteers from my church I grew up in who helped me with the puppets and stuff like this. And um, it was a lot of fun, but in the end, um, that ministry actually saw some really powerful <laughs> Results. Here I was preaching in full clown makeup, and we had young people, children, receive the Holy Ghost during some of our meetings. So it, you know, it was uh, the thing about Jiggle was he was very fun and, and very uh, funny. You know, everything I did when I would talk about biblical stories and stuff, you know, I always presented them in real fun and funny ways. So the kids laughed a lot, and the adults loved this program. The adults loved my Jiggle program. They really did, because they laughed their heads off. You know, they got a big chuckle out of it. I didn't do a lot of physical comedy, so to speak. It was really all just in the way I would talk and the way I would share things. But in the end, I was conveying some really powerful lessons and some important lessons for the children. And uh, as I say, many times we'd have an altar call at the end and kids would come down and they would literally wind up receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I did that for about four years. And after the first time when I was 12, after the first time, I did a program in my local church. Our church had just, not too long before, had a pastoral change. And uh, one pastor left, a new pastor came in. And the new pastor, Brother John Harmon, came to me. And he said, Chuck, I cannot believe that I'm about to ask a 12-year-old if you would do this. He said, but... I really believe you can do it. He said, you know, I've watched your children's ministry and, and how you work with the kids. He said, would you be willing to be our, uh, our children's church director? So I became the children's church director at the age of 12 in the church that I grew up in. And uh, children's church, for those of you that don't know, that is where all the kids go during uh, Sunday morning worship so that they're not under their parents' knees and driving their parents crazy while they're trying to be in church. And it's a special program for the kids. So I became children's church director. Well, I felt led to uh, basically turn the children's church program into a miniature church program. So what I did was, I said, okay, uh, we're going to have church. We kids are going to have church down here, just like the adults have church upstairs. And some of you are going to be ushers, and some of you are going to help me by doing this and that and that and this. And we, of course, sang children's songs, you know, um, 
Uh, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, you know, those kind of songs. And so we sang children's songs. But the funny thing is, I literally wound up preaching. <laughs> and it wasn't a game to me, folks. This was not a game. This was as serious as anything could be. Uh, you know, Jiggle, like I said, the Jiggle ministry was very serious for me. Um, my children's church uh, ministry was very serious. We had kids receive the Holy Ghost. We had wonderful, we, we had people healed of cancers in our children's church that came up for prayer. Kids that had cancer came up for prayer in our children's church and received their healing. And so it was a tremendous experience. The, I did that for four years when I... Uh, shortly after I turned 16, I immediately got a job at a local grocery store as a checker. That was my first job. And uh, the Lord spoke to me after a couple of months and said, I want you to go to Texas. I said, Texas? What on earth do I know about Texas? I don't know anything about it. I've never been, never visited. I didn't know anything about Texas. And uh, he said, you're going to be a preacher of faith. And if you're going to preach faith, then you need to learn how to live by faith. Too many preachers get up and preach on stuff that in reality they have never in their entire lifetime lived. They've never lived it. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound mean or anything, but folks, there's a lot of preachers out there. Uh, their daddy was a preacher and their granddaddy was a preacher. Or their, you know, and they were a favorite son, so to speak, you know. And when they came into ministry, they were able to go to Bible college. And when they come out of Bible college, they were able to get uh, immediately appointed to this wonderful pastorate at this church over here where they're making a salary. Now, please understand, a lot of people don't understand this, but in most, and I'm, I'm going to specify this for a reason, I hope don't offend anybody, in most white church denominations, um, preachers do not make a lot of money. They do not. This idea that pastors make these humongous salaries and stuff, you see more of that in the black community to be, I'm talking plain. Um, and there's a reason for that, but I'm not going to go into details on that right now. It has a lot to do with the structure of the denominations and, you know, the way they structure things. But in the white churches, uh, per, you know, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Nazarene, Foursquare, so on and so forth, um, pastors are under very strict um, salary guidelines. Um, when I eventually wound up in the Church of God after moving to Texas, I, I went into the Church of God denomination, which was very similar to the Assemblies of God, but a little more old-fashioned. Uh, it was part of the holiness movement. And that's what the Assemblies of God used to be like many years ago. But they had kind of loosened up and become more liberal in many ways. So I went into the Church of God. I love the old-fashioned ways. I love the old-fashioned worship. I love the old-fashioned move of God in the church that I became a part of. Um, but... Um, I kind of lost my direction there for a second. All right, so anyway, so the Lord called me to Texas. I didn't know squat about Texas, didn't know anything about Texas. The only thing I knew about Texas, I had a great aunt, my mother's mother's sister, who lived in Texas and had lived there for many, many years, my Aunt Dorothy, she used to come up every summer because she hated Texas heat. And since she grew up in, in New England, um, she would come up every summer and spend a few months in Connecticut with family during the summer months so that she could escape the heat of Texas. 
well, I loved my Aunt Dorothy, and I thought the world of her, you know. And uh, she was Pentecostal as well, but she went to a Church of God versus an Assemblies of God. And um, I loved the way she worshipped. She was kind of demonstrative. Boy, she'd shout and, you know, just let the Holy Ghost move. And I loved that. And uh, New Englanders tend to worship um, more reservedly. The, it's not that, like in the, in the church I grew up in, it's not that there wasn't a marvelous move of God, because there was. But in the South, you know, people shout, woo! They just let out with a hoop and a holler, you know. And in the North, they were a little more reserved than that, you know. And so the worship was a little more reserved in the North, and, and Dorothy was a little more of a Southern worshiper, you know. And so I always kind of admired the way she worshiped and everything, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, when the Lord spoke to me at 16, I contacted my aunt and I said, the Lord spoke to me to come to Texas. I said, could I stay with you at least until I can figure out a place and get a place my own and everything. And I was literally 16 months, excuse me, 16 years and about uh, five months old, not quite 16 years, five months when I got on an airplane and flew to Dallas Fort Worth Airport, my Aunt Dorothy picked me up and uh, she brought me uh, to her house. And she had a little house in Fort Worth. My parents' house was four times the size of my poor aunt's little house. And uh, they put a little bed up for me in their dining room. And, you know, I felt awful having to take up their space. Uh, but I arrived on a Saturday. And on Sunday, I went to church with her. And uh, I walked through the door at the church that she attended for many, many. She had been there for about 30 years at that time. And I walked through the door of that church. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. As I walked through the door, I could feel the Holy Ghost on me so powerful and so sweet. There was such a sweetness that came over me just walking through the door. And there was something else that was, it was almost like handcuffs or shackles that I wore that I didn't know I had on fell off. And I felt this freedom just walking through the door. I felt this freedom. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't even understand what this freedom feeling is, you know, because... What was I bound by? What was I shackled by? Well, I found out. Uh, during the course of the worship service, uh, they were singing some hymns and stuff, you know, and this church kind of leaned in the direction of the old Southern gospel style. They, they very much gravitated towards Southern gospel hymns and Southern gospel style music. They were not big on contemporary gospel or quote-unquote worship music. They didn't use none of that. Just good old-fashioned Southern, very country kind of style church, even though it was in the heart of the city of Fort Worth, and they had a couple hundred people. Well, this particular, it's a Sunday morning service, never been there before, and they're singing, and people are clapping, and boy, you could feel a joyous spirit in the house, you know, but uh, there was nothing particularly uh, exciting happening. There was nothing particularly demonstrative happening. All of a sudden, they were singing this old song, um, his love lights the way for me. I never had heard this song in my life. It was a Southern gospel hymn that I had never heard. I've left the old paths. I traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Of Jesus, my Lord, I sing this new song. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way I travel today. I'm shouting the victory. My sadness is past. I'm happy at last. His love lights the way for me. Who oh, that song got on me. Oh, my God. We were singing that, and I could feel the Spirit of God on me like somebody was loading me up with dynamite. I just, I, oh, I just felt this build up in my spirit, you know. And then we started to sing a verse. Uh, 
Um, the pleasures of sin, no more I desire, no good in them, now I see. The Spirit has set my being on fire. His love lights the way for me. All of a sudden, I jumped up off that pew and started dancing all over that place. And I mean, I just danced all, I've never done that in my life in church. Never, ever, ever had had ever done anything like this in church. And I danced all over the place. And who, by the time I come down from that high and sat back down, I was so embarrassed because <laughs> nobody in the church had done this. So it's not like I was following suit or, you know, or following something else somebody else was doing. No, no, no. I didn't see that at that point. And uh, after the service, <laughs> We were leaving, and all these old high hair holiness Pentecostal ladies are coming to me. Oh, young man, your oh, your blessing really touched me today. Whoo! I'll tell you what, I got so blessed seeing you get happy. And I sat there literally, and I thought, oh, well, thank you, you crazy man. I don't, I don't know what she's talking about. How did my blessing somehow or another? bless them, you know. I, this is how new to all this I was, you know. Uh, of course, over the years, I learned that a lot of times, if you're not the one getting happy in church, you still get blessed watching somebody else get happy, you know. So anyway, and all these people kept you know, telling me how my getting happy blessed them, and you know, and, and so I didn't feel quite so odd. Well, that Sunday night, we had church, and Brother Gillum, the pastor, uh, got up, and he used to ask people, especially on Sunday night, he would generally ask three different people to sing specials. That church had talent in it like it was going out of style. We had musicians and singers till the, till they were falling out of the woodwork. And he would ask three people to sing. Well, this particular, my second service in that church, um, on a Sunday night, you know, he says, well, Brother Chuck, Sister Overton tells me that you sing, son, so why don't you come up and sing a song for us tonight, you know? And I said, okay. And I'm looking at Aunt Dorothy, and I'm like, what, what do I do? How do I do? She said, well, he picks, he, he has three people. You go up, you sit on the platform there till he, uh, uh, you know, he'll hand it over to you. When he does, you sing your special. When you're done, you come sit down. The next person will get up and sing, you know, in the order that he asked them. Well, he had asked me first. So I went up, I sat on the platform, and he talked a little bit, and he's okay, Brother Chuck, come on, you know. And I went up there, and I took the mic. And I thought I was just going to share a quick testimony before I sang. Well, as is often the case in a good old-fashioned Pentecostal Holy Ghost-filled fire-baptized church, the Holy Ghost come over me. Remind, remember, I'm 16. The Spirit of the Lord come over me, and I literally just let loose and started preaching. And I mean preaching, honey. And the folks were shouting and clapping, and everybody's along with me and all this. And after a few minutes, I'd say maybe 10 minutes, I really didn't go like a real long time, but I went 10 or 15 minutes. I kind of... <laughs> The only way I know how to explain this, I came down from my high, you know. All of a sudden, I kind of came to myself, and I realized, oh, dear God, I've just preached to these people, and they don't know me, and I don't know them, and, oh, they're going to think I'm a nut, you know. And I'm standing, and I literally walked toward Brother Gillum and reached the mic out to him, forgetting that I was supposed to sing. And Brother Gillum, who sat on the front pew facing the platform while people sang specials, he always did that. He got up and he walked up to me, he put his arm around me, and he took the mic and he said, Well, I believe the Holy Ghost is using this young man tonight. He said, I'll tell you what, I think we need to have a prayer line. And he looked at me and said, Are you ready for a prayer line? And I looked at him and I went, Uh-huh. I didn't know what a prayer line was. Honestly, I had no idea what he was talking about. 
In New England, we did things different. When we would have, uh, if you wanted to uh, offer for people to come down and get hands laid on them and pray for them, what have you, we would just uh, open the altars, so to speak, and people would come down and they would come fill the altar area at the front of the sanctuary, and then you would go, the preacher would go or whoever, and lay hands on people one at a time, you know, across the front and make his way through the group and pray for everybody. So I didn't know what a prayer line was, never heard that term before. So all of a sudden, people, a bunch of people in the sanctuary get up and they get in a line down the front of the center aisle of the church, you know. They, they start a big line going from the front all the way to the back door of the church, and they're in a line. And Brother Gillum gets the anointed oil, and he brings the anointed oil, he hands me the anointed oil, and so I know how I know how to anoint people with oil and pray for them. I said, okay, I guess I see what's going on here. So I would anoint my finger with oil, and the first person to come up, I'd lay hands on them and start praying for them. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost come down and touch them, and they get to shouting, and all of a sudden, they're running the aisles, and they're dancing across the front of the sanctuary, <laughs> or they're getting happy some kind of way. And... I've never seen this before. I've never experienced this before. This was all new to me. At one point, my little nine-year-old cousin, um, my Aunt Dorothy's grandson, uh, her oldest daughter's oldest son, he comes up. And I haven't been, you know, involved in children's ministry for so many years. I did what I do, and I got down literally on my knees in front of him, so we were about the same height, and I said, Sean, honey, what do you want the Lord to do for you? And Sean said, Chuck, I want the Holy Ghost, and he was just crying. He said, I want the Holy Ghost, and so I put my arm, my left arm around his back, and I put my right hand on his forehead, and I said, Master, in the name of Jesus, fill him right now, God, with the Holy Ghost. And when I did, that kid literally just fell backward, and I had to lay him down on the ground. I had to bend over on my knees, mind you, lay him down on the ground, and he was just speaking in tongues. He had received the gift of the Holy Ghost just like that. My cousin called my mother after that service that night. She said, you won't believe what your son did. Said, it's his second service in our church. She said, and God anointed him to preach. Next thing you know, he's praying for people. And folks, I'm here to tell you, I, I kid you not, people received the Holy Ghost that night. People received their healings that night. Uh, one man in the church, Brother Dow, had had a very severe back problem for many, many years. He had had surgeries. He had had all kinds of uh, treatments. And he was constantly in pain, and he could not do certain movements. And uh, that night, he was in the prayer line, and I prayed for him. And he testified about a week or two later that after that service that night, he went home, went to bed. He said while he was sleeping, the Lord gave him a dream. And in his dream, he said, I drove this old beat-up jalopy car into a junkyard. He said, literally, there were just junk cars everywhere. And he said, in the middle of this junkyard was a beautiful brand new Cadillac. And he said, and the Lord said to me, get out of that and get into this. He said, I'm giving you a brand new body. I'm touching your body. You're trading in the old one you've been driving, and you're going to have a new one. And Brother um, Dowell, in, when he shared this testimony about a Sunday or two later, he literally was bending over, touching his toes and doing all this. He said, folks, I could not do this for 20 years. I couldn't do this. He said, I have been in such pain, I wouldn't even dream of trying to do this, you know. He said, but when that young man, when the Holy Ghost anointed that young man that night, he said, uh, I got my healing." So there's a little encouragement for some of you folks. 
just because it takes 20 years for your healing to come doesn't mean your healing won't come. And just think of how powerful a testimony that miracle was for Brother Dow. After 20 years and after all those surgeries and all that, God touched him and healed him in a moment's time. So anyway, I wound up in the Church of God. Uh, I joined the Church of God. I loved the church my aunt had been part of for so many years. Brother Gillum, the pastor there, became one of my most beloved pastors that I've ever had in my life. I learned so much from that man. And uh, the Lord told me he was bringing me to Texas to train me for my ministry. And so I could learn to live by faith and what have you. And Brother Gillum became one of the most powerful uh, influences on my life and on my ministry. I learned so much from him, and it was just at the right time because obviously I'm coming up upon uh, young adulthood and I'm about to enter into uh, ministry for myself. So uh, there were a lot of great lessons that if I had not gone to Texas, when the Lord called me to Texas, there is so much I know that I know that I know there is so much I'd have missed out on. There is so much. If I hadn't obeyed God, there is so much that I would not have learned and experienced. Uh, and there'd be so much today in my ministry that would be missing. All right. So uh, basically, during my time in the, the old Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, I really found myself in, uh, when I say found myself, I mean um, my ministry and my and my myself as a believer really, really blossomed and came into its own. And uh, I really became, uh, I was always a very old-fashioned kind of Pentecostal guy, but uh, I became, you know, ver very much an old-fashioned Pentecostal preacher, uh, and what I mean by that is I believe in the move of God. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that um, the Holy Ghost is real. I believe in worship that is in spirit and in truth. Um, I don't have a problem, one, with somebody shouting. I don't have a problem, one, with people dancing. I don't have a problem, one, uh, with people running the aisles. I mean, I'm, I'm old-timey, and, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, LGBT or otherwise, that's who this preacher is, so you might as well know that up front, okay? Uh, I believe in good old-fashioned uh, full gospel Holy Ghost religion, as it were. And uh, so uh, I wound up starting, uh, after a while, I left Texas. I went back to Connecticut where I grew up. And um, I wound up going through an internship program in the Church of God. Um, and I served in a local Church of God in Connecticut under a pastor. They had you read a number of books. They had you take tests. Uh, you had to read the Bible in a certain amount of time from eight, from Genesis to Revelation. It was an extremely intense program. Honestly, it was almost an impossible program to go through. Uh, but they said that they designed it this way on purpose because uh, Pastors and preachers have to learn to manage their time, and there are so many demands on ministry. They said that part of the rigors of the program was to expose you to the rigors of ministry, you know. Uh, as part of the program, I uh, would serve in any capacity that the pastor asked me to serve in. He had me direct the children's church for a while. He had me teach Sunday school for a while. He had me do a number of things, you know, in the church. I would go and visit the sick in hospitals. Um, uh, I would try to go and comfort the dying. I mean, all the things a pastor does, I did during the course of my internship program under uh, Brother Carver, Douglas Carver. 
and uh, at the West Haven Church of God in West Haven, Connecticut. Immediately after the West Haven uh, program was over, uh, I wound up starting my first church in the Church of God, and I started it in uh, one town over from the town that I was born and raised in, and it was actually the town that my father was pretty much raised in, and uh, his family all lived in in uh, the Seymour area, and um, they were not church people at all, never had been, and uh, my mother's side is the opposite. They were all assembly of God mostly, and you know, very much fundamentalist evangelical Christians. My father's side were very much unchurched and unfamiliar with church and what have you. So I wound up starting my first church. Um, I told my overseer when I started my first church, I was um, 19 at the time. And I told my overseer, I said, brother, uh, the Lord's told me that inside of a year, we're going to have over 100 people. And to long story short, inside of a year, we had over 100 people. And that was from conception. I did there exactly what I've done in Huntsville. I literally rented a space, set up chairs, handed out flyers. The only difference was, of course, we were mainstream church, so I could advertise in local uh, newspapers and what have you, you know, that of course helps. And so we wound up with about 13 people in our first service, uh, but by the time we organized, meaning by the time we graduated from a mission church status to a full-blown official congregation of the Church of God, it was five months, and between starting the mission and becoming an official congregation of the Church of God, um, we were running between like 40 and 60 people just in that five-month period of time. We saw miracles like I can't even begin to tell you um, the miracles we saw. Uh, we saw people delivered from demonic influences, uh, we had people come in possessed by devils, and I know some of y'all, you don't believe in that, and you don't understand it, to be frank. Um, but I'm going to tell you something. There are people you look at, and you think they're just crazy. And they're not crazy. They've got demonic influences in their life. We had one lady come in that anybody who observed her that didn't understand these things from a spiritual perspective would have thought she was just flat completely nuts and out of her mind. Uh, she lived at home with her husband and kids, but she um, was disheveled and dirty and and her, her clothing didn't, she didn't even wear the same socks, you know, nothing about her. She just looked like a nut, like something that crawled out of bed. And, just, and she talked to herself constantly, and she was just um, goofy as, as all murder. And I happened to meet her at a Christian bookstore in our um, town that a couple that was one of the founding members of my church, uh, they had started this Christian bookstore, and I met this lady at the bookstore. And she was so off the wall and goofy, you try to talk to her, you couldn't hold a conversation, you know. Well, I gave her one of our church cards and invited her to come to church. And one of my church members worked behind the counter. She wasn't one of the owners. Sue and Leo owned the place, but um, uh, Judy was another member of our church who worked there. And <laughs> Judy said to me, you invited her to our church? I said, yes, honey, I did. I said, that woman's got demons. And she said, and you invited her to our church? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. I said, because we can help her. There are a lot of churches that can't, but our church can. Don't you know that lady showed up at our church the next, I think it was the next Sunday or so, and uh, again, uh, for time, I'm not going to go into all the details. Long story short, I wound up spending two and a half hours casting devils out of this woman. And she came back to church the next Sunday, completely washed, hair washed, nails done, 
everything clean, her wearing a beautiful outfit, looking sane and normal. And she said, I don't even understand what happened last Sunday. She said, all I know is that when I left this building last Sunday, I felt like I lost a thousand pounds. She said, I literally felt like I lost a thousand pounds. She said, I went home and for the first time in like seven years or six or seven years, she said, for the first time in that many years, she said, I literally went through my house this week like a hurricane, cleaned everything, washed dishes, cleaned my kitchen, mopped the floors, vacuumed. And she said, I, for seven years, I haven't been functioning. I haven't been able to do any of these things. She said, I've done it all. Said, my kids are in utter shock. My husband is freaking out. He can't believe what's happened. But see, folks, I'm here to tell you, when God delivers, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, we had, I, I could tell you so many stories of people that God delivered and, and saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. We had such an incredible move of God. It was, it was just phenomenal. Our church became known around the community. I went to buy gas one day and I happened to mention to the guy back then, they still pumped your gas, you know. It wasn't all self-service like it is today. And I happened to mention to the guy who had pumped my gas that I pastored this church. And he said, oh, I know that church. And the first thought that went through my head was, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, we're new. We, we're, we're, we're small. We don't have, you know, 30, 40 people at that point, you know. And I'm thinking, how can he possibly know our church, you know? And then he said, that's the church where Celine, um, I can't remember her last name off the, off the top of my head, uh, got healed. She had ovarian cancer, and she got healed in that church. And I sat there, and I said, well, I'll be a son of a gun. He does know our church because I knew exactly who he was talking about. And that lady had, in fact, been healed of ovarian cancer in our church. So, uh, you know, it... I was getting phone calls from around the country, from all over the planet, people uh, calling with prayer requests, people. I had people wanting me to go to Puerto Rico, wanting me to go to different places to cast out demons because there was no preacher local, which broke my heart. There was no preacher local to them that did this, you know. And uh, so anyway, we saw miracles and miracles and miracles. Um, I actually knew a Christian man who was a quadriplegic, and he, his sister was a member of our church, and she kept inviting him to come to church, and he literally said to his sister, I'm not going in that church. She said, why? He said, because that preacher of yours won't let me out of there till I get up and walk. And she said, well, what's wrong with that? But he was happy in his current situation. Everybody loved him and thought the world of him and, you know, pitied him for being in his situation. And he wanted to stay there. And, and honest to God, he knew that in our church, we could believe God for a miracle for him. And to this day, I absolutely believe that he could have received that miracle. I've seen people get up out of wheelchairs, folks. And I mean... I've seen it happen in, in meetings that I was preaching without anybody touching them, without a soul touching them. People that were all curled up and crippled, and all of a sudden I watched, as the, and I'm standing up there trying to preach, and I'm watching their hands straighten out and their feet straighten out, and two ladies in one service literally pushed themselves up and stood up out of their wheelchairs about give me a stroke. Um, in the middle of a service. So do I still believe in miracles? Do I still believe in the power of God? Yes, I do. Absolutely, I do. And uh, I went on later. Uh, again, I returned to Texas after my first church. I had this issue inside of me. My first church, I was a single pastor. And the one thing I was terrified of early in my ministry 
was that at some point I might do something stupid or I might do something foolish and it would wind up destroying all the hard work I had done to establish a church. So I literally didn't want to spend a lot of time in any uh, community that I was in. I wanted to establish a church, get it established, and then let the church of God bring somebody else in to pastor and me move on. And that was all because of this gay issue, to be frank. And I was celibate. I was not doing anything with anybody any kind of way. But I didn't want something to happen and wind up blowing up, you know, everything that I had done. I didn't want to hurt people. I didn't want something to happen. And people... Um, to be won't wind up being hurt spiritually or what have you. So I went back to Texas. I wound up meeting a girl that uh, actually wanted to marry me. And I started my second church while she and I were engaged. It was close to Fort Worth. Uh, she was from Fort Worth. She was tied uh, to her mother at the hip. And I knew I couldn't take her very far from her mom or that was going to be real problematic. So I talked to the overseer in Texas and uh, there was a community outside of Fort Worth that did not have a church of God. And I said, um, I've been praying about it and I feel like this is where the Lord wants me to start a church. So the overseer said, okay. And a few days later, he called me and said, we're going to give you half the rent for, I had found a little church building in that town that was for rent, little building, little cement block building, really just a little chapel, you know, probably held maybe 40, 50 people tops, you know. It had an office, it had a little, little sound room and a couple of little bathrooms, and that was it, you know. And uh, we got some pews from a church that had a, a a chapel that they were renovating and so they were uh, gonna sell the pews you know and so we got those pews and brought they were little six foot wide pews they only could hold two or three people you know and we had them and we had kind of a wide center aisle and then aisle on the outside of each you know um, we could have used maybe eight foot pews but that's not what we had available to us we used the six footers you know anyway we had a marvelous move of God in that church, and things happened there that I could tell you stories from now till doomsday. Uh, wonderful time. However, I wound up getting married, and after a month, a month, this girl and her parents decided that they had made a mistake letting her get married. She was like uh, 19. And I was all of 21, I think, at the time. And so um, uh, she was terrified of intimacy, to be frank and honest. We never consummated our marriage. And that was fine with me because, you know, I had issues. So I, <laughs> you know, as long as I was married, I thought that was going to fix me and that was going to make everything right. And so anyway, when all this transpired, it, th it really threw me into a depression. Uh, frankly, I became suicidal because it was like, Lord, you know, I've been trying to do everything in my power to be straight and to do things right and not to do the other. And, you know, and I finally thought I was on the right track. I found a girl, I got married, you know, and now this is all being torn away from me. And uh, plus, it was, it was hurting my ministry. Because in the church of God, if you're divorced, and my mother-in-law, my the girl I married, um, we could have gotten an annulled legally, and it would have been perfectly legitimate because we never consummated our marriage. But I didn't know nothing back then. You know, I didn't know anything. So my mother-in-law thought she was slick, and the reason she did the divorce route rather than an annulment is so that she could possibly tap into future benefits like, you know, if I were to somehow come into money or something, you know. Well, anyway, um, so I went through a really rough time after all that. Like I say, I became suicidal and it was just a mess. Um, 
I want to go back into uh, evangelical ministry after taking a little hiatus. And um, the Lord moved. I preached all over Texas and all over the place. <sighs> all right. Now, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to fast forward here. In 1989, I finally decided I could not live the struggle that I had been living for so many years. I was depressed, I was despondent, I was lonely, I was miserable. The fact that I was now divorced, listen to this, the fact that I was now divorced made me uh, off limits to every Pentecostal girl on the planet. There was nobody wanted to touch a guy that was divorced. Um, especially they weren't going to marry a guy that was divorced, you know. So uh, no matter how I tried to find a woman and go, you know, through all that again, uh, nothing was working. It wasn't going to happen. And so I wound up going through a really rough experience that I've talked about in the past, and I'm sure I'll talk about it again in the future. But I'm not going to talk about it tonight for the sake of time. I went through a really difficult uh, experience in a church. Uh, they kind of got wind that I might be gay because of something that they saw. And uh, I had never done anything, never been with anybody at that point. But these people got it in their head. And next thing you know, I was being cursed and cussed, literally cussed. The F word was flying like you wouldn't believe from the mouth of a Pentecostal preacher telling me I was a queer, I was a child molester, I was a pervert, I was a rapist. I was a, he accused me of everything under the sun, all based on accusation. Not, nothing substantive, nothing at all had ever happened. But this, you know. So I, I know what it is, folks, to go through a horrendous outing experience okay well after all that happened honestly i just told the lord i said lord i've tried all these years to do quote the right thing i've tried my entire life i've been struggling i've gone through depression i've been suicidal i my whole life has just been this constant horrible horrendous miserable sickening struggle and I said, I cannot do it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. I said, I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm going to be who I am. This was in 1989. Um, and I said, and whatever, if I wind up splitting hell wide open, so be it. I said, all I know is you're never going to see me in a church again so long as I live. Because after what I went through, I wasn't about to step back into another church ever. And... Uh, my faith never wavered. I never stopped believing in Jesus. I never stopped believing in any of the things that I had believed in. But I just could not ever see myself darkening the door of a church uh, again. There was just no way that was ever going to happen. And i have gone through such humiliation and embarrassment and, and, oh my goodness, you know, being put down and and... Oh, I just couldn't, I can't even tell you how bad it was. So anyway, that was in 89. Well, I count my official coming out as Mother's Day 1989 because I left Texas. I came back to, again. I, I kept going back and forth for a while. I went back to Connecticut, the state I grew up in. I arrived the day before Mother's Day 1989. And I had made up my mind. And on that bus, I said, Lord, I'm, I have to take a bus. Didn't have money for a flight. Uh, on the bus, I said, Lord, when I get back to Connecticut, that's it. I'm going to be who I am. I'm going, that's it. And, and that's what I did. And so when I got back to Connecticut, I got a job at a local car dealer selling cars. And they gave me a demo. And yes, they gave me a demo on my first day at the job, believe it or not. Um, it's kind of similar to the experience I had with the overseer in Texas when they offered to uh, 
partially support starting a new church. That's something that they never did. And my overseer asked me, he said, do you know why I'm doing this? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, I spoke to Brother Chandler, the state overseer up there in Connecticut, and he told me that you know how to start a church, son. He said, he told me that whatever you ask for, I'd be a fool not to give it to you. Because if anybody on this planet could put a church together, you could pull a church together. He said, that's why we are breaking tradition and we're actually putting money into your ministry from day one without any promise of a church at all. Um, they put money behind me when I started my second church in Texas. Well, similar happened when I went back to Connecticut and I applied at the car dealer. I told them, I said, listen, I just arrived from Texas. I came in by bus. I said, I do not have a car. If you want me to work for you, you're going to have to give me a demo. Uh, back then they gave salesmen demos, but usually you'd have to wait, depending on the dealership, 30 to 90 days. And the sales manager told me, he said, well, we don't give demos first day on the job. He said, you've got to wait however long it was. And uh, I said, well, I'm just telling you, frankly, I'm being honest with you. If you want me to work here, I'm going to have to have a car. I don't care if you give me a used car off the used lot. Doesn't matter to me, but I'll have to have a car. Well, uh, they called me a couple days later and said, can you start Monday? And I told the guy on the phone, I said, I told you I, I don't have a car. You know, I don't have a way to get there. He said, if you can get here, we'll have a car here for you. And I said, okay, well, I'll be there then. So my grandmother gave me a ride to work that morning. I drove home that night in a brand new Ford, brand new. They didn't give me a used car. They gave me a brand new car. And my grandmother said, what on earth? She, she was flabbergasted. She said, how on earth? Could you start a job and they just give you the keys to a brand new car? And I said, well, you know what the sales manager told me? And she, of course, she didn't know. How could she? I said, uh, Dan told me that he had called Mickey down at the dealership in Austin that I had worked at before going back to Connecticut. And Mickey, the sales manager in Austin, said to him, that guy will make you more money than any salesman you've got on your floor. Said, let me tell you something. Whatever he needs, you give it to him. Said, trust me, he'll, you'll, you'll get your money back out of it. So uh, the sales manager in Connecticut told me that himself, you know. So that's why they give me a demo. Well, that demo was a godsend because from that night, I was able to start going... The only thing I knew how to do was look up gay establishments, you know. And I began to go to a local club and hang out. And to, I was scared out of my mind. I never, you know, I mean, literally a virgin, you know. I, I did never been with nobody, no kind of way. I was scared out of my mind. And, but I wanted to be around people like myself. I wanted to see what what being gay was, and, you know, I mean, I was so ignorant and so naive, it wasn't even funny. And the experience that I had coming out was so amazing. It was so different than what I expected. Based on what I had heard preachers preach on television and all, I thought all these men, I was going to walk into the club and I was going to have to fight people off, trying to grope me and people trying to sexually abuse me. And, you know, I mean, literally, that's the way they paint the picture, you know. These evangelical and fundamentalists, that's the garbage they preach to try to scare the life out of people. Well, it worked. But when I went to the Copacabana, in New Haven, Connecticut, um, it was so not at all like that, not even close. Uh, matter of fact, some of my earliest friends there were women, and some of the ladies, the lesbian ladies, became friendly with me, and um, and again, I was so scared, you know, I didn't just walk up and approach people and all, you know. And so anyway, and some of the older men who were kind of regulars there, they took me under their wing and 
they were so protective of me because they could tell I was a newbie and I was scared and you know and not a one of them ever made a pass not a one of them ever said anything off color not a one of them ever tried anything they literally would just uh, try to counsel me and guide me and they would tell me you know be careful don't don't just be out there hooking up with everything and you know and they told me and, and there were times I'd say something about boy isn't he beautiful you know this particular person I'd see and they'd say um, Chuck honey you don't want to mess with that don't get involved there and I didn't know why you know and they'd say well you know, he puts more money up his nose than you make in a year, you know. And so they had a drug problem or whatever, you know. And but they literally were trying to protect me and guide me. And so from that day until about, uh, well, from when I first walked into that club, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me while I was walking into that club and said, you could minister to these folks and you could help them understand that my grace works for them too and not not in a you need to change way you know but that God understands them and God accepts them and that their uh, my grace is sufficient for them as well and I literally said Lord I could never convince them of that because I don't even believe that and for about three years, I was out of church. I'm going to go overtime tonight, just so you know, so I can get all this out, okay? Now, I'm not going to go river long, but I'm, I might take as much as an additional half hour. So um, uh, I did a lot of things after I came out. You know, at first I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Uh, after getting burned about 40 times by one night stands and you know how it works I became very disillusioned and very discouraged and it's like well nobody wants anything substantive nobody wants anything real they're just out there to use and be used and blah 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 and so um, I always always was looking for love always I I, I I never really was, um, I've never been somebody that honestly enjoyed just sleeping around to be sleeping around. That's never been my cup of tea. I've always been, since day one, very relationship oriented. And so, but, after you get burned so many times, you know, even though you're still kind of looking for love, at the same time, it was like, you know, when people would just disappear and you never hear from me, you're like, well, of course, what do you expect, you know? And so anyway, I wound up doing a lot of things and going a lot of places. Um, worse than that, to be honest with you, was just how much I let myself um, go in terms of... Um, you know, when you're trying to live the Christian life, you try to keep your temper under control. You try to keep your attitude right. You know, you don't go after revenge. You don't um, treat people dirty. You know, you don't, um, um, you know, you try not to be hurtful to other people. Well, I was going to hell in a handbasket, so all that went out the window. And I was just living my life. But, well, honey, you know what? If you mess with me, I'm going to mess with you. And if you do me dirty, I'm going to do you dirty right back. And there were many occasions where I got my revenge. And, you know, uh, and I'm not a violent person by nature. And, of course, growing up in church, you know, I was never a violent person or anything. But uh, I had a couple of people thought they were going to get physical with me at some point. And you don't want to do that because I've got some capabilities that I didn't even know I had. And, you know, so there were a lot of things I did, and my mouth, whew, ooh, the stuff that come off my lips. I was like Peter, you know, when Peter denied the Lord and nobody believed him, and finally he started cussing and cursing to try to separate himself, you know, from Jesus. Uh, let me tell you, that was me. I talked, I turned the air blue 
blue, 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 blue. Um, and it was not on occasion. It was every day, all day. Um, Tommy will understand this, but, you know, you know my brother. Well, that was me. You know, that was me. And uh, I never really drank. I never did drugs. Those were things that I grew up not doing, so I, I just really didn't have a big interest in them. I uh, dabbled in smoking a little bit, not drugs, but uh, I, I was too fancy for cigarettes, so I actually smoked uh, little tip cigarillo cigars, you know, I used to love them little cherry ones and what have you. And and again, I did that for a little while and then it kind of fell out of favor because growing up in the Pentecostal movement, none of those things were part of my life and they just really didn't appeal to me overall. Uh, I went through all kind of phases. Oh, honey, you, I could show you pictures of me with all kind of hairstyles, with a perm, with all kind of earrings, with all kind of jewelry, with all kinds of clothes. I moved to um, New York City at the, around 1990, the beginning of the 90s. I lived there for about the whole decade of the 90s, roughly. And I loved the atmosphere of New York in that you were free to just kind of be your own person and do whatever you wanted to do. So uh, I've always been a very creative person, and I'm still a very creative. I love to do anything that involves creativity. So I began to become very experimental with my dress, my clothing. And I used to wear some of the wildest, craziest outfits you ever saw. Not, you know, not with like spikes and spiked hair, not that sort of a thing. But I, I used to have some, uh, honestly, some long black spandex pants, um, or I don't know if you call them pants, but long spandex, you know, went down with the ankle. And just to give you an idea, um, and I would wear those, and then I would wear a tuxedo shirt, and I had, I, I would go to the women's department and buy these really unique belts. You know, one thing about women, they get these really cool belts. Now, I was a lot skinnier then, okay. Um, they have these really cool belts, you know. And I bought this one belt that was elasticized. It was about six inches around, black. And in the front, it had these patent leather sections with three kind of Western, almost style belt buckles that went across the front. So I put on that, uh, those black long spandex and I put on my uh, tuxedo shirt and then I put the belt around my waist. At the time I had a 32 inch waist, so it's a lot smaller than it is now. And I wear these ankle high boots with socks pushed down just to the above the boot level, you know, and I'd wear a black bow tie and I had these arm straps, these black arm straps uh, that back in the day the bartenders used to wear them way back in the old west to hold their sleeves up, you know, so they wouldn't get into the drinks and into the sinks and stuff while they're washing dishes. I mean, I created all these looks and all these different and I constantly, literally, when I lived in New York City, I used to have people ask me all the time, are you a designer? Do you design clothing and stuff? And I said, well, no, why do you ask? I said, you have such a unique style, you know. You, the way you dress is so cool. You just look amazing, you know. And I got a lot of compliments back in the day. Um, I just, I just loved being free in New York, you know, to be very expressive and, you know, creative with my dress and all that sort of thing. So I, I've been through some phases. Some of you young people, you know, you look at us older folks and you say, oh, he doesn't understand me. He doesn't get me, you know. Trust me, I do. Been there, done it. Bought the T-shirt, okay? Um, yeah, I, I, I could tell you some stories, some, some things I've done, and, you know, and some of the outfits I wore and what have you, you know. And some of y'all, probably Amy and Marvin and... And uh, Cynthia, you know, y'all are probably looking at the screen right now going, 
Pastor Charles did that? Yes, I did. And uh, I, I went through such phases, I'm telling you, trying to find myself, you know. I went through the queenie phase early on where I thought, you know, being gay was all about being flamboyant and hello. Hi, girls. Oh, how you doing? You know, and I thought that's what being gay was all about. And finally, over the course of time, I, I came to myself again. And I just, you know, realized there's no such thing as being gay. Uh, it's all about being yourself. You know, the LGBT community is comprised of many different types of people. And uh, every one of them has the right to be themselves. Um, I've never had trouble with people in the transgender, transsexual community. Um, that issue is not at all difficult for me to deal with or, or to accept. Um, I've known God only knows how many. I know some very famous um, transgender performers that you see on TV. Uh, when you look at the movie um, Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, in the opening sequence and then at the end where they have the big competition and all these drag performers are up there performing, um, I know quite a few of those performers. Um, many of them were from New York back in the day. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I have no problem being around somebody who is flamboyant, who is kind of, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, a little circusy, okay? That doesn't bother me. You know, hey, if, let people be themselves, for heaven's sakes. For one thing, who you are today is not necessarily who you're going to be. 10 years from now either, okay? Because just like me, a lot of people go through phases and they have to find themselves. They have to kind of go, you know, if they grew up at this extreme, they may wind up going over to this extreme before they finally find center for themselves. And that's what I did, you know? And so I can accept people, I can understand people, I don't have a problem with effeminate fellas, I don't have a problem with uh, masculine ladies, I don't have a problem with people who are TG. Um, none of that is an issue. I've known many. Um, finally, around 1993, my partner at the time wound up coming into the Pentecostal faith during a little breakup that he and I went through. And we got back together, but when we did, he said, guess what, I've come into the Pentecostal faith. He grew up Catholic. But because of me talking all the time about how much I miss church and how much I miss the move of God, how much I miss seeing the Lord heal people and deliver people and save people and fill people with the Holy Ghost, uh, my testimony as the back slidden believer literally spoke to him and he grew up Catholic and he said I didn't know what you were talking about I had no clue what you were talking about so when we went through a breakup little breakup he went and started going and visiting this church in Brooklyn and he wound up being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and we wound up back together and when we did and he told me this, I was like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. And I thought, well, I'm really in a quandary now because I told the Lord I was never going back into the church no kind of way. And now I got a partner who's had an experience with God and I fear God. Now, when I use the term fear, I do not mean I'm afraid of God. That's a mistake a lot of people make. When you use the term fear in a biblical sense, it literally means to, to pay homage to or to give consideration to um, someone or something. For instance, if you say, well, I fear the law. You're not saying I'm afraid of policemen or I'm afraid of, you know, judges. No, what you're saying is that I 
pay attention to the law. I consider when I make decisions, when I do things, I'm mindful of the law. You know, if I'm driving over the speed limit, I'm mindful of the fact that the speed limit is only 70. You know what I'm saying? So when you say, you know, I fear my parents or I fear um, the Lord, you're simply saying that God is someone that I really seriously consider when I make decisions and do things. And so therefore, when Jason told me he had come into the faith, I knew that if I was not careful, I be in the way I was at that time, that I could really drag him down and cause him to lose out with God. And I didn't want to do that because I, I, th I said, it's one thing to wind up in hell for myself. It's another thing for me to wind up in hell and wind up dragging somebody there with me. I said, I can't do that. So I said, okay, Lord, you did it. You got my attention. So Jason and I began to visit several churches trying to find one that we might be able to kind of sneak in and, you know, and kind of worship and, you know, and be part of, but not really be too visible or whatever. And we could not find a church that really worked for us. And it wasn't even that we couldn't find a church that was big enough that we could blend into. But again, I come from old time Pentecostal stock, honey. I'm not interested in no dead old dry church where people just go in and, you know, uh, play church. If I want to be in church, I want to be in a real church. I want to be in a church where the power of God is moving, where the spirit of the Lord is real. I want to be in a real, honest to God, Holy Ghost church. We could not find a church like that in, in New York or in New Jersey or in Connecticut that we could be a part of. So at that point, I knew I was going to have to to start one, to be frank. Um, I just He and I decided, I said, I'm going to try to start an affirming ministry, something that is uh, welcoming and affirming of LGBT people. And I didn't have a clue how to go about doing it, didn't have a clue what I was doing. I didn't know if anybody on the planet had ever done this before. So long as, uh, so far as I could understand, I thought I was the first person in the world doing it. I honestly was not aware of any other, you know, gay Christian organization or anything. I had never heard of metropolitan community churches and so on and so forth which would not have suited me anyway, because I, I'm, anyway, we're not going there. Uh, but that's not my kind of church either, so that wouldn't have suited me either. So in 1993, long story short, I began my foray into LGBT affirming ministry. I started doing an enormous amount of research. I did not read any books. I did not read any articles. I didn't read any pamphlets. I didn't read nothing by LGBT or LGBT affirming authors, all I did was go to the Word of God, literally. I was raised to believe that the final authority is Scripture. And so I, the, the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to look into some things because you have a lot of misunderstandings. So I began to search the Scriptures. I began to go back into the original languages the Hebrew, the Greek, the Chaldee, uh, I began to deeply study um, a lot of subjects related to LGBT passages that are used against gay people, you know, Genesis 19, Romans chapter 1, so on and so forth. But before I even did that, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and I said, Lord, I don't even know where to begin, you know. Do I begin at Genesis 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Do I begin at Romans chapter 1? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, no. He said, do not start with a passage. Start with a subject. There is a subject you need to study. And I said, well, what subject is that? And he said, grace. You need to look at the topic of grace. 
I spent months and months researching and studying grace. And I'm telling you folks, by the time I came out of that study, I knew, I knew that 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 there was no reason under the sun that an LGBT believer could not make heaven, could not serve the Lord, could not experience the benefits of living for God, could not be blessed, could not walk in divine favor, could not experience the power of God, couldn't receive the Holy Ghost, couldn't obey the gospel and be saved. I knew, because when you understand grace, which most churches today do not, especially fundamentalists and evangelical, they sing about grace, they talk about grace, and they don't even know what grace is. If you really spend the time to examine the doctrine of grace in the Word of God, it'll blow your mind. So that was how I started. Uh, that's how the Lord first brought me into affirming ministry. Then, of course, I began to go into what we refer to as the clobber passages. And I began to look at Genesis 19, Romans 1, Leviticus, so on and so forth. I want to tell you, uh, I shared online yesterday a whole series of links. Uh, many of those websites have been up for well over a decade. Some of them, if I'm not mistaken, probably been around 20 years. Um, the articles that I wrote early in my affirming days, my early affirming ministry days, are all part of the Come Out Believing website, which is located at www.gaybelievers.org. And if you go to Come Out Believing, gaybelievers.org, uh, there's a link on that uh, website for articles and Bible studies. Many, many, many of those articles and Bible studies, I literally wrote, way back in 93, 94, 95. And because early in my affirming ministry, I didn't know what to do or how to do it. So what happened, to be frank, is uh, I just did a lot of research, a lot of study, and a lot of writing. And then uh, I was being invited to preach in mainstream straight churches. And I didn't know what to do about it. And the Lord told me, I told you when I called you that if a door opened to you, you're to walk through it. And so uh, when I'd be invited, you know, Jason and I, at that time, mind you, approached things from sort of a don't ask, don't tell perspective. And um, so we didn't broadcast our relationship, you know. And But I began to be invited. I'd get invited in one church, word of mouth. I'd be invited in another church, another church, another church. For the first year and a half, two years of my affirming days, I preached in dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of mainstream churches. And I was preaching my new understanding of grace and my new, you know, what the Lord was bringing me into. And we were experiencing powerful, wonderful meetings. We had some marvelous, marvelous services back in those days. Then in 19... I'm trying to remember the year, if it was 96, 94, 98, I would have to look at it. Um, I had started, Jason and I had parted company. I went through a two-year relationship with someone else, and I started to work in New York City. And that person then told me that he didn't want to be the preacher's wife. So he encouraged me to start the church in New York. We started having meetings at the Gay Lesbian Community Center in Manhattan on 13th Street. And then he said, after about three or four Sundays, literally, he said, I don't want to be the preacher's wife, and left me. So I said, well, at first, I, I literally thought I was going to just shut everything down and quit because I didn't want to do a work as a single gay pastor, you know. 
And uh, the Lord said, no, I called you to preach, and you're going to do the work I've called you to do. So I kept doing the work in New York and did that for several years. Uh, just before 9-11 occurred, at the very, very beginning of 2000, uh, the year 2000, I moved back to Connecticut. I was having some health problems. Um, it honestly looked like I was going to die. And, uh, and I was um, losing a lot of weight. I was having trouble with digesting food. And everything was going straight through me. And I went through this for about a year and a half. Doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so I wanted to move back to Connecticut where I was from. If I died, if, you know, my family wouldn't have to try to come to New York City and figure out a way to transport my body and all that. Literally, that's how I was thinking. And, but I said, Lord, I won't keep working for you till, till I die or until you come. So when I went back to Connecticut, I started to work in Connecticut. <laughs> and we had meetings in Connecticut. I was sick as a mule. I was sick as a pig. And uh, I still was preaching. And we had several people coming to church in Connecticut. The work in New York never really took off. Uh, after several years, we never, never, never could get a group of consistent, supportive people. And when I say supportive people, I want you to understand something. This preacher, of all the preachers on the planet, is not after your money, okay? So when I say supportive, I'm not even talking about finances, God always finds a way to meet our finances. And in our church, we don't spend a lot of time talking about money. Come to our services and you'll see. Uh, watch our services online and you'll see. We don't talk about money in our church. We don't even pass an offering plate in our church. Um, we believe in tithing and offerings and all that, but it's always between the, the believer and God. You know, whether or not you do so, and uh, how much you give, what you give, when you give, that's between you and God. But we do not hound people for money. We are not by any means that kind of ministry. When I say supportive people, I mean people who come and understand that their role, being faithful, being consistent, being there, is as important as my role is. You have no idea how important it is that you have a consistent, faithful base. It's imperative. You cannot build a church without it. In seven years in New York City, I could never get a supportive base together. We'd have seven people one Sunday, two people the next. Four people the next Sunday, one person the next. 14 people the next Sunday, two people the next. Literally, it was like that for year after year after year. And it was extremely frustrating because you cannot build a church when you can't get people to be consistent and committed to what you're trying to do. So uh, that's why, you know, I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm going to leave New York. You know, release me. So I can leave New York and go back to Connecticut. That way, if anything happens to me, my family won't have to, you know, come chasing after my body. Went back to Connecticut. Long story short, again, I have a testimony about how God gave me a miracle in 2000. Um, and you can hear that testimony online. I've shared it separately. If you're interested in it, I'll send you a link and you can hear that full testimony. The Lord literally, literally delivered me from my deathbed, literally delivered me. I was on life support for a month, and he literally touched me on my deathbed and brought me from death uh, and restored me. And uh, then I eventually wound up making my way to Dallas, and in 2001, Tommy and I met. Uh, I wound up, I had actually contemplated going to Dallas instead of Connecticut when in 2000, but I was so sick, you know, that I thought Connecticut would be better for my family, so on and so forth. In 2001, though, 
I'd come to Texas to visit my mother for Christmas. And I went to Dallas to play a little pool. A friend of mine online had invited me to come play some pool. Tommy and I met, yada, yada, yada. That romance started. And um, I told Tommy, I said, you know, it's interesting because before I had gone to Connecticut, I actually contemplated for some reason, Dallas came to mind, and I thought about coming to Dallas way back in, you know, 1999, 1998, 2000. And, uh, you know, um, but I told him, I said, I, I, you know, um, if I were to come down here, I'd have to stay with my mother to make the transition. And I love my mother, but that is not a good idea for many reasons. <laughs> And I said, I can't do that. I can't stay with her. And, and, you know, even for a month or two or three to make the transition. So long story short, my car busted up and would not drive when I was trying to go back uh, home to Atlanta at that point because I, I did a brief stint in Atlanta between Connecticut and Dallas. And I was trying to go back to Atlanta. My car wouldn't drive. It started bucking like a Bronco. My brother, who's a mechanic, came out, picked it up, brought it back to his shop, told me the transmission was blown. I was on disability. I didn't have the money to fix the car right away. So I was stuck in Dallas. And uh, Tommy and I kept seeing each other during that time. And I said, you know what, I'm going to look around a little bit and see what the possibilities for moving my ministry to Dallas would be. Uh, there are certain things that I look for. You know, do they have a publication I can advertise in? Do they have a good LGBT community? You know, um, how hard would it be for me to communicate with the, the community as a whole, so on and so forth. And actually, everything in Dallas looked really, really good. So I told Tommy, I said, you know, maybe... Maybe I should have come here in 2000 when I was thinking about it. And so he offered for me to stay with him till I could get my own place so I wouldn't have to stay with my mother. And I literally stayed with him for three months, and that's it. And then I got my own place. And for the first eight years of our relationship, we did not live together. And, uh, you know, I don't encourage people, meet today, marry tomorrow. You know, this foolishness of meeting today and moving in tomorrow. Honey, that is a surefire way to have an awful relationship experience. Trust me, it's a terrible way to start. If you want your relationship to last, there are many, many, many things that you can work out and work through when you have your own places in the beginning. And uh, that's what he and I went through for the first eight years of our relationship. Was sometimes we lived literally one door apart from one another in the same apartment complex. Other times we lived just around the corner from each other. And of course we spent all our time practically together. But we always had that neutral you know, space to go back to. We could go back home and cool off if we got aggravated with each other, whatever the case might be, you know, and it really helps. Believe me, it helps. So uh, I wound up spending 20 plus years in uh, Dallas. We had a lot of good times, but it was very much a struggle. Affirming ministry is a struggle trying to get people to come to church and be faithful and do what they need to do so you can build a church. When you're dealing with LGBT people, folks, it is a struggle. That has been my experience now for 30 solid years, okay? But I've been working in our community for 30 years. My ministry is consistent. You can go back, look at our YouTube channel. You can look at the Dallas Church. It's still out there. I'm not about to take it down. We got over 600 followers on our Dallas channel. And um, so we still post our Sunday service um, messages on our Dallas Church channel as well because many of the people from Dallas who followed our ministry when we were there um, still follow it. 
you know, we, we count them as extended members, meaning non-local members. And so in order to accommodate all the people on our uh, Grace Oasis um, channel, all our subscribers, I post our services and our sermons and our Bible studies to our new church, YouTube, which doesn't have very many subscribers at the moment. We'd appreciate it if you'd come and subscribe. Uh, forward CLC. Just look up the word forward, F-O-R-W-A-R-D, C-L-C, all one word on YouTube, and you'll find our channel and subscribe. But for the sake of 640 or so met, um, people who follow our old church channel, we I still post not our live services, but I post our messages and our Bible studies still to that channel as well. So, uh, and we get a good number of views on that channel of those things as well. All right, so long story short, I've been doing this thing for 30 years. You're not looking at somebody who's a newbie. You're not looking at somebody who is uh, a novice. Um, I've been in ministry long before I came out. Uh, I've pastored in the mainstream. I've been now in affirming ministry. I'm very open now. I allowed the New York Daily News in the late uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, they approached me. They had heard about our church in, in New York, meeting at the Gay Lesbian Center. And the religion editor contacted me and said, can I do an article about you? He said, I've never heard the words gay and Pentecostal in the same sentence. So he said, could, could I possibly do an article? I said, sure. If you're interested in seeing that article, let me know. I'll send you a copy or send you a link so you can look at it. Um, they did a big article with a big picture and everything. And, uh, you know, so when I did that, I really kind of cut myself off. Remember all those churches I told you about in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut that I had preached in during the first part of my, my early affirming days? Well, the minute that article came out, I knew that I could never go back to those churches, you know. So the minute I allowed that article to be done, and the title of the article is, He's Gay Shepherd with Old Time Fire. That's the way the religion editor titled it. He's Gay Shepherd with Old Time Fire. And... Um, so, you know, when I allowed myself to come out that publicly in one of the, uh, with a newspaper that has one of the greatest circulations in the entire country, you can buy the New York Daily News in Los Angeles, you know, you can buy it in many major cities around the world for that matter because it's that big a paper. Um, when I allowed them to do an article on me, you know, I was fully investing myself, hoping that I could reach out to LGBT people and help them understand that God loves them, He accepts them, He understands them, and that His grace is extended to them. It works for you as well as it works for anybody. And uh, again, I referred to the post that I made I may copy that post and put it in the description with this video. And that way, if you want to look at the various web ministries we have, websites we've created for LGBT believers, um, uh, our, our different Facebook groups, our different um, TikTok and you know, Instagram and all that, uh, you'll have those links. I'll include that in the description for this video, okay? And uh, what was that? There was one other thing I wanted to say before I closed, and of course, it just, that's what happens when you get old. Um, anyway, okay, well, I guess I probably then have said everything I need to say, I imagine. <sighs> I appreciate your time. I'm sorry to have talked so long, 
but I really wanted to get, you know, as much information in your hands. Just imagine how long I'd talk if I'd have given a lot more detail with every, you know, I tried to cut out the excess detail as much as I could so I could keep it a little more brief. This video will probably wind up being uh, edited. It'll be about a two-hour video. But I hope if you live in the uh, Huntsville, Alabama area or in the Birmingham area, we eventually hope to go to Birmingham and maybe do a service in Birmingham every... <clears throat> we may start once a month and eventually make it a once a week. Um, so we can possibly have a satellite work in Birmingham at some point. Um, I have a burden, folks, to reach our community. I'm doing everything in my power to reach and minister to as many people in as many ways as I possibly can. And so we need you to come out and help support us. We need you to come be part and understand that if all you do is come, and sit in the seat and listen. Um, believe me, that just that role alone is important. It is very important because there are going to be people who come and they're not going to be interested in a church that only has a handful of people. They're not, you know, you might be okay going to a tiny church for at least in the beginning, but there are many people who are not. And so we need as many people who are willing in the beginning so that it can help make those who aren't willing more comfortable when they finally do come, okay? So uh, we need to get 10 or 15 or 20 people in the seats every Sunday faithfully, consistently. You've got to look at it like it is a real commitment, you know, because that's how important it is, okay? And um, if we can get that, I'll tell you right now, it won't take very long before uh, it'll blow up and we'll have a whole lot more folks coming. But you've got to get to that 15 or 20 people mark. That's what I wanted to say real fast. I want to explain and I want people to understand. I talk a lot about LGBT uh, uh, because... That is a segment of our population that many churches just neglect and reject flatly. However, our church is not exclusively an LGBT church. We don't bill ourselves that way. I'm not interested in being that way. Our church is open to everybody, but it's very hard to find non-LGBT people who are willing to worship with LGBT people uh, because they've been indoctrinated with all this negativity and foolishness, okay? But uh, about half of our church traditionally has always been non-LGBT and the other half is part of the Rainbow family. The same thing is true of our online membership. About half the people online who follow us and consider us their church are part of the uh, rainbow family and the other half are not. So our church is here for everybody. We are about bringing people together, building bridges, establishing understanding. I want this church to be a place where a gay lesbian person can literally bring their straight mom and dad. Do you follow what I'm saying? That is the vision of this ministry, okay? Um, it's not about trying to build a segregated church. You know, well, they reject us from their church, so bless God, we'll just go over here and create our own. No, 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 no. That's not our mission. Our mission is to be the kind of church that God meant his church to be from the beginning, okay? And that is inclusive and affirming of all sincere believers. All right, folks, that's all the time I'm going to take from you tonight. I hope and pray that you've gotten something from this. If you're free on Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we do our services at a, a very different time, and that is to try to accommodate people. 
um, and make it as easy as possible for you to participate. You don't have to get up with the chickens and come to church at 10 in the morning. Uh, you can go out to brunch, you know, you can do some errands, do what you got to do. You can sleep in late and then at 3 o'clock be ready to come and get fired up and, and uh, you know, um, get passionate about your faith, experience the power of God. And believe me, you're going to go into the next week with a whole lot of inspiration, a whole lot of hope, a whole lot of faith. Uh, that you didn't have when you came in the building. And then, of course, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we do our Bible studies. Right now, we're doing them from our home here in Decatur, Alabama. Um, if we get some folks coming and they're interested, we can move them to the church space in Huntsville, okay? Um, for those of you that are interested, Forward Christian Life Center, uh, Pastor Charles Burnett Laura. We are located at 3322 um, Memorial Parkway Southwest. It is a second floor suite in the 500 building, suite number 537, um, Huntsville, Alabama 35801. If you have mobility issues, there is a raised parking lot at the back of the building. Just drive straight through it and you'll see the, the driveway goes up a level. And there's a raised parking lot and there is a ramp that comes across to the second floor for people with wheelchairs and mobility issues so you don't have to climb the stairs to come up to the second floor. Um, so there is a ramp at the back of the building if you have mobility issues, okay? Um, I hope and pray that somebody from Huntsville and from our area is watching, and I hope and pray that this just simple introduction to uh, me and our ministry will help you to decide, yeah, that's something that I'd like to be a part of. All right? I hope to meet you soon. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.